We'll call the meeting to order. Let's stand and say we pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our invocation will be by the Reverend Keith Grog from the Montreal Presbyterian Church. Reverend Grog. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilors, let's bow together. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on all those who hold office and seek to serve their communities. We lift up the town of Black Mountain and ask your blessing on the mayor and the members of the board that they may do their work with wisdom and be led by your spirit of justice. Help all of us as good citizens to respect neighbors whose views differ from ours so that without partisan anger we may work out any issues between us. Grant that your spirit may so move every human heart that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, and that with our divisions healed we might live in justice and peace. Guard brave women and men in uniform who put themselves at risk, be it in service of their municipality or their country. May we all be led by your wisdom. May we all search your will and see it clearly. In your many names we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, I don't have any announcements here, so we'll just get right on into the citizen comment. First up is June. Al yes. Yeah, come on up to the podium there. And please say your name. Uh, June Advincula. Advincula. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have All right, you have three minutes. You have three oh, minutes. I have three minutes, okay. You're going to tell me a warning, right? That would be... Oh, oh gosh. i got to watch the green light. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I am June Advincula, and I live at 5, 507 High, Wesley Avenue. And this property, I look at it. <clears throat> and I have my little space there, and I love living here. And I guess how I want to address it is why I live here. And I got to thinking about, and the reason why I live here is because I feel safe. Um, I, I'm a runner, I used to be a runner, now I walk, and I feel very, very safe living in Black Mountain. Um, and that's, and also, I like the green spaces that I see when I walk around on Black Mountain. I walk <laughs> everywhere around Black Mountain. And, um, and I feel like Black Mountain is the place where people want to come and retire. I'm entering close to my retirement age. I teach here in Buncom County, and this is the place that I want to retire. I really want to be here. And I've lived here since, uh, uh, at least six or seven years now, and um, tell you the truth, I really go into Asheville. Everything I want is in Black Mountain, um, and if I need something, I go into East Asheville, but I really go into Ash Asheville because I don't know where to park, but here, it's very friendly. It's, I can walk downtown, and I, but the big issue for me is I feel safe. I feel safe living here, and I would like to keep that, that feeling of feeling safe here, whatever is being built in back of me, um, and to, to foster citizens who will come here who feel the same way. They want to retire here. They want to live in a place they feel safe living here. They want green spaces. They want a place they can walk downtown. Everything I need is downtown right here. I mean, even this community, I read in a newspaper maybe three, three months ago where we've got, I don't know, like 20 churches here. We've got uh, so many restaurants here. It's, we're, it's all here. If we want to foster people who want to live here in this community and, and become, become consumers of what's in town, and give back to the town. I mean, I'm a member of the Swannanoa Valley Museum, and there's, you know, I, I do, I'm doing the rim hikes. 
but foster those kind of people who want to live here and retire here. Thank, thank you, just let me oh, the, thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks. <laughs> Next up, Marilyn Szymanski, recycling. Oh. Good evening, everyone. I'm here to share with you our special recycling event that's coming up this Saturday. It's the flower pot, plastic flower pot recycling event at the Black Mountain Garden Show and Sale. And that's held at the Monta Vista, 9 to 4, this Saturday. And our collection helps people with all the flower pots and trays that you have because they cannot go into the curbside recycling. They do not belong there, only containers for food, cleaning products, and personal care items like shampoo can go in the curbside recycling. So we have a special collection once a year, and you can bring your plastic flower pots and trays and the plastic markers. They can be broken or they can be intact, and uh, people pick them up to reuse them. So it's like drop off what you don't want and pick up what you do on a first come first serve basis as is. We just ask you to tap the container or rinse it to get out most of the dirt. And that's it, please do not bring any clay, uh, wood or metal objects with you. Any questions? Thank you, Marilyn. Appreciate it. All right, next, Gay Fox. I'm not sure that I, the issue that I want to talk about is on the agenda. Okay. I'll wait. All right, thanks. Uh, next, Pat Tannett, 106 Fairway Drive. No, I don't want to say anything. I just came as a listener. <laughs> okay, very good then. Uh, next one would be Jamie Cameron. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Alderman, and Town of Black Mountain staff for allowing me this opportunity to air my concerns regarding the development of 35 open acres off of Bird Road into a high-density 250-unit residential and commercial area. I appreciate the opportunity you've given me to speak in defense of my neighborhood, which I believe is threatened by this proposed development. My wife, Sue, and I moved into our home at 606 Hiawassee Avenue during the summer of 2010. Had we been residents when the town's planning board first sent out notification of the pro proposed construction six years ago, I can assure you that you would have heard from us back then. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this issue has been dormant for six years, and the board did not see fit to re-engage those residents who will be affected when it chose to give final approval to the construction plan that will forever change the nature of our neighborhood. I don't know when the last time any of you visited my neighborhood was, so let me describe it to you. The Bird Road, Hiawassee Avenue, and their junction with Cragmont Avenue on the Swannanoa side of town. My neighborhood today epitomizes everything that makes Black Mountain a great place to live. There are friends and neighbors from all walks of life, young professionals, recent retirees, lifelong residents, and college students. We have a farmer on Hiawassee Avenue who grows much of the food we eat and sells her wonderful produce at the Black Mountain Farmer's Market on Saturdays. We have beekeepers and chicken coops, shade gardens and fruit trees. We have deer and bears and a pair of nesting red-shouldered hawks on the corner. When the mood strikes us, we can walk from Becky's Farm to buy vegetables to dynamite roasting for coffee and Foothills Butcher Shop for meats and cheeses. We can even walk to the Blue Cone for ice cream on those hot summer nights, which are coming up. That said, we have to be on our toes while walking our two dogs and pulling out of our driveway when it's time to work or go to run errands. Hiawassee is a cut through for many town residents on their way to US 70 and the interstate. We have gone so far as to ask, ask the Black Mountain Police Department to run speed traps on our street to deter speeders. In short, our neighborhood is charming and inclusive and in spite of the existing, in spite of the existing traffic, the idea that a 250 unit development could somehow be absorbed by the in existing infrastructure is highly unrealistic. The traffic study this board considered when it approved the Roberts Farm project is now six years old, and I doubt if it accurately projected the actual impact, even if we were back in 2009. This project, if it goes through as suggested, will create a traffic nightmare in my neighborhood. It will be unsafe. It will negatively impact my life and the lives of my friends and neighbors. I am dismayed to read 
the town aldermen have also allowed a variance on the building height restrictions in place for the rest of Black Mountain. Now, instead of looking out onto the beautiful lower slopes of the Black Mountains, we are faced with a wall of three-story condominiums and the prospect of 10 years of construction, traffic, and noise while this project moves forward. I trust that all of the elected Appreciate officials... That. Thank you. I brought back up. <laughs> Next will be his wife, Susan. Hello, my name is Susan Cameron, and I'm going to just finish off uh, where my husband left off and add a couple of additional points. So he left off with, I trust that all of the elected officials sitting here tonight who, vote, who we voted for ran for public office for the noble reason of improving the lives of the people of Black Mountain and protecting us from unwelcome advances on our quality of life. I am telling you unequivocally that this project, as planned, will have a hugely negative impact on myself and the people of Hiawassee, Bird, and Fairway Drive. Please do the job we elected you to do and negotiate more reasonable terms so that everyone can come to love my neighborhood the way that I do today. Thank you. And then I just wanted to add um, a couple of additional points. Um, I wanted to point out a little more specifically um, some concerns about the traffic. Um, first of all, this high density, um, the, the high density of the development will also result in a very large increase in traffic on Hiawassee and Bird as well as the surrounding areas. We would expect the increase in traffic to be somewhere around 300 to 400 cars per day. So that's huge. Again, 300 to 400 cars per day. And we believe that these small roads cannot safely support this increase in traffic. Furthermore, uh, there's only one entrance into the development which will exacerbate the problem um, and then there's the planned commercial space, which will also add to the traffic issues. And then lastly, we hope that whatever development occurs at Roberts Farm, surrounding property owners have a say in the way the land is developed and that it's done in a way that limits impacts to these property owners. Many people move to this area because it is quiet and walkable. We are concerned about noise from 10 years of construction, the increase in lighting, the amount of impervious service, surface, and potential for increased flooding, as well as safety. And we hope to be included in the conversation about how these concerns can be addressed by the developer and the town. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Steve Holland. Thank you, my name is Steve Holland. I'm Mayor Sobel and members of the Board of Aldermen. I'm here today as a phase 2A property owner in the settings of Black Mountain. Thank you for your persistence in obtaining the bond money. I know that that was not an easy task. If these funds are administered and used properly, this $1.5 million can enhance the tax base of the town and reinforce the reputation of the town's government as a responsible steward of public funds. I'm encouraged that the town is off to a good start by requiring public administration of the funds and public bidding for the project. While a case can be made that there may be some additional costs associated with the strict requirements of public bidding, your commitment to a transparent process is to be commended and will instill public confidence. Similar transparency by Henderson County officials in administering bond proceeds obtained for infrastructure at the Seven Falls development near Etowah has earned them accolades by local media and taxpayers. If these public dollars are not carefully administered, money may be wasted and town taxpayers could be on the hook if lawsuits occur after bond funds are exhausted. There will almost certainly be a shortfall between the cost of the infrastructure that affected property owners would like to see completed and the amount of available bond money. How this shortfall is handled by the town is critical. Chapter 160A, Article 10 of North Carolina law specifically authorizes towns to issue special assessments against benefited owners for the very types of infrastructure needed at the settings, and that law specifies how the cost must be allocated among owners. Utilizing the town's authority to issue special assessments would ensure that property owners in all of the settings are treated fairly and equitably. For instance, the bond money designated for Phase 2A, where my lot is located, should fund the majority of the final top coat paving left incomplete by the developer, but not all of it. I expect to pay my fair share of the shortfall for Phase 2A, uh, no more and no less. The most efficient and fair way to facilitate that is through a special assessment by the town of all Phase 2A owners for the shortfall. 
I hope the town will seriously consider using special assessments for each phase of this project. I would like the opportunity to sit down in the near future with town representatives to discuss this option. Even if the town were to forego issuing special assessments itself to cover the shortfall, it should still ensure that the same fair and equitable methods specified in Article 10 are followed for this project. As some of you know, there are multiple parties with disparate interests in how decisions for this project should be made and how this money is spent. As the holder of the purse strings, the town has the power to compel these various parties to come to an agreement, which would help insulate the town from litigation. To that end, I ask that the town convene a meeting in the near future with these parties in the hopes it can lead to an agreement being forged that avoids the need for declaratory relief in Superior Court, similar to that sought by Henderson County for Seven Falls. This would allow more of the money to be spent on infrastructure instead of court costs and attorney fees. Steve, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Could I leave a copy of this for each of you? Thank you. Next up, Doug Brock. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Doug Brock, and my family of four have been grateful residents of Black Mountain for 31 years. I would like to speak to you briefly tonight as a conscientious real estate land developer and as a settings property owner. Currently, the town of Black Mountain finds itself in the unenviable position. It is charged with managing a great deal of money, approximately $1.5 million received after a lengthy lawsuit against an insurance company that had issued the bonds required by local government. Yet another reason to be grateful for local government. I don't have time to detail the many struggles the settings community has experienced since the developer left several years ago. However, you are no doubt aware of the significant decrease in property values. The town has lost over 60% of its tax values in the settings these last four years. And many of the settings property owners themselves, those whom have invested heavily in the American dream of home ownership, have been financially devastated. The land area covered by this bond money has some of the most challenging and steep home building terrain in Buckham County. And this steep terrain is very prone to landslides that could endanger property and human life downslope. The very heavy rains we experienced in 2013 undermined the roads and adjacent slopes, and those report repairs alone cost more than a quarter million dollars in the settings. In truth, its recent ordinance that the town has on its books today were enforced. Much of this land area this bond, over, bond covers could not be built as planned today. The steep slope ordinance, the storm water ordinance, and the state mandated blue stream ordinance all would not allow this land area to be developed as the original developer intended and platted. I'm available to escort any of you that are unfamiliar with the settings to see for yourself the challenges the terrain creates, and you will see firsthand my valid concerns. I highly recommend that the town consider hiring its own geotechnical engineer before the town approves any expenditure of construction money from this bond. Please do not doubt the town now finds itself to be the developer of this property. I ask you to consider and spend cautiously, as it is my opinion the original developer did not. The original developer pursued profit. The Board of Aldermen should choose prudence and caution. Please take the time to learn the issues and consult with all the resources the town has at its, its disposal, especially your own common sense. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doug. Chris Eller. I'm good. I'll pass. I'm actually here with Sykes and Cheshire, so we'll be ready to speak in some of Very good. Okay, that's got it for the people that had signed up for the citizen comment. Now get the communication from the boards and commissions. First up will be the land of the sky, uh, Stacey Freeland. Good 
Good evening. My name is Stacy Friesland, and I work with the Landis Sky Regional Council in the Foster Grandparent Program. Um, thank you for allowing me to come out tonight. I requested the chance to come speak to share what a great resource we have in our area agency on aging and our volunteer services department. Um, I have been in the program currently for going on 12 years and I can honestly say some of my greatest memories have come from the elementary school or the primary school here in Black Mountain and the volunteers that have served there. They, are, um, they leave a, a warm special place in my heart so thank you for allowing me to come. Um, we, I like to think of Land of Sky as kind of a little hidden resource, a little pocket um, that has some great services and opportunities um, that we are there to um, answer any questions, to help give support to caregivers caring for loved ones in their homes or out of town. Um, if you are looking for volunteer opportunities, we are also there that can match up um, people for those services as well. According to the last census, 35% of the residents of Black Mountain are 60 and older. And I think that's just going to keep growing and growing. And as the beauty and community um, just lends itself, I think, for more people to retire here. So um, this is a time of year that our departments come together and we celebrate National Volunteer Week, which occurred about a month ago. We're also celebrating National um, I keep seeing those strawberries. May is also Older Americans Month in which we celebrate um, older adults and keeping active and healthy in the community. Volunteer Services, our department, um, had close to 400 volunteers offer all sorts of different services to the community, um, which range anywhere from helping special needs children work one-on-one -on -one with an older adult as a tutor or a mentor, um, but also working as volunteers in the police department um, and helping a, a senior companion, helping a, a person be able to live independently in their home without going to nursing home. Um, while volunteers and hours are great and they strengthen the community and do all the good things that um, might not be able to be able to afford um, for the community, um, the 400 hours the volunteer services department contributed to Buncombe County equals almost 2.9 million dollars. So it's really a um, invaluable resource to the community. Um, currently, 15 of us in the Volunteer Services and Aging Department are there to, <coughs> to work to the community to offer any support or services. Um, so I urge you, if you have any volunteer service needs or any, any needs that have anything to do with older adults, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Andrew Wagner from the Urban Forestry Commission, <coughs> Arbor Day Update. How do you switch the slides? I do. Oh, you do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, I'm Andrew Wagner with the Black Mountain Urban Forestry Council here in Black Mountain. And uh, I'm here to kind of recap our project of uh, getting the, tr the town recertified as Tree City USA, um, as we were before. Um, the council was established to, um, you know, investigate problems that the town has and issues that the town has surrounding trees and infrastructure, as well as trying to promote sustainability and a healthy urban forest for this community. So having the town established as an Arbor Day Foundation helps us with potential grant funding in a lot of different areas that we could be looking for more money for projects and things like that. So, um, The Tree City USA program um, has been established for 
quite a while. Um, last year we were trying to go through the process, but we recognized that the record keeping we needed to be started from the beginning of last year. And so this is the year that we, we're, we've been keeping track of the funds um, in order to make sure that we spend the $2 per capita that is required for the eight and a half some odd thou thousand residents that we do have here in town. Um, so from January 1st to now, we're, um, we're on track to exceed that by a great deal. So uh, 16,000 is about what we'll need to get the $2 per capita. And we're already at about, um, about 11,000, I believe. So um, we're, we're well on our way. Um, last year, we held the Arbor Day in November. Um, it was down at the dog park behind the bylo. It was a successful event. We pruned a lot of those young, immature maple trees, um, air spaded the roots, and looked for root issues that young trees have commonly have in order to try to make sure that those are trees that that park can utilize for long into the future and they're not just outgrow their space and become problems that we then have to deal with. Uh, it was attended by the Blue Ridge Arborist Association, which I'm also a member. Um, the Urban Forestry Commission, we were all there, and uh, Mayor Sobel, and, uh, um, and, uh, what, and Mr. Alderman uh, Harris, you were there? Yeah. I was trying to, I thought it was you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been a while. Um, yeah. And, um, and then there was some, several other members of the community, so it was it was a good day. It was a lot of fun. Um, that's the the picture on the screen is of air spading to use air to uncover the soil around the tree roots, and that way we can actually visually see the root system of the tree and prune it properly um, in order to make sure that the tree has the room it needs to grow and it doesn't suffocate itself because that's a common problem with bald and burlap trees that are dug out of a nursery. Um, so that's another picture. Uh, this coming year, uh, we have an, our, the upcoming Arbor Day is scheduled for November 14th, and uh, we're, going, we're planning on having it um, in the, on the north end of Lake Tomahawk Park, near where the Parks and Rec has the, the music over the summer, and, and uh, we're going to prune all of those young maple trees, hopefully look for root issues. And then also um, take, use the event, it's a, it's a much more public area, so we're hoping to get a lot more public of the public out so we can do some teaching and, and outreach with, among the community. Uh, we're also going to be at the, um, the plant sale at the Monta Vista this weekend, handing out brochures and educational pamphlets for members of the community so that they know how to properly be a good steward for the trees that are on their property. Um, and so with the completion of the Arbor Day this fall, we will have allocated, we'll have kept track of the resources that we need to, um, to spend the $2 per capita. We'll have the established Arbor Day where we'll rededicate the city as a true city USA and, uh, and we'll hopefully be pretty easily um, reinitiated as a as a Tree City USA. So um, we would also like to at, see if we can dedicate a tree at the next Arbor Day to Van Burnett, who was a member, chairperson of the committee for many years. Um, really very a great friend, good dedicated individual who worked diligently. And uh, we'd like to plant a sugar maple um, in that general area, sort of in the northwest part of the park. Um, close to the golf course, uh, he, he said a sugar maple would be nice. That's what he was looking forward to, hoping for. So uh, we'd like to, to plant that as well, if that's all right. And I don't mean to interrupt, Andrew, here, if you don't mind. Generally in the past, when we've dedicated things, we've made a, the board has made a motion to approve that. And so if, if, if that was appropriate, I would, I would ask that yeah, if you're if going to want to, if, at least if the, the urban forestry is going to want to dedicate it, maybe the board could also authorize them on their behalf just so they don't uh, yeah, so we, so we don't feel like they've, they've just put a tree somewhere. Yeah, so we were, would love to do that if that's all right. Go hear a motion. So, so yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, opposed? Good. Unanimous. All righty. 
Um, and so uh, we're also hoping that in the coming year that if you, as you all are confronted with uh, citizen comments and concerns and questions regarding the trees, that you'll bring those issues to us. Um, myself and Andy White and the other board members have uh, really kind of taken it upon ourselves to try to educate ourselves and become good advisors if there are any tree um, relative issues that you all are in need of a little bit of advice or have questions or comments or looking for new tree species. I know Jamie asks us questions periodically when he is um, looking to solve issues with power line conflicts, sidewalk conflicts, view conflicts. I know that that was an issue last year. We were, wanted to make sure we maintain view corridors in town. Um, so I hope that you will uh, tap on our shoulder as things come up in the future and hopefully come out to the Arbor Day. Good, thank you. Let me make a couple points uh, so that the audience is, is aware. Uh, as, as Andy said, he worked with Jamie. One of the most important things that they've done over the past few years is to uh, inoculate the hemlocks around town. Uh, in fact, at this juncture now, there's been, I think it's through 2014, they've inoculated 922 trees. Uh, that is, most of that work was done by Jamie and our, and our department, but Andy helped to give some uh, advice on this. If you have to take down, most of these trees are in rights of ways. So that if you had to take down just one of these trees, you're probably looking between $700 and $1,000. And as you've noticed, maybe you have some in your own yards that the hemlocks have, because of the woolly adelgid, have died. Can you imagine the, the expense to the town if we had to take down all <coughs> these trees if they weren't inoculated? So I thank you very much for helping with Jamie and giving the uh, advice and the way that y'all work together on that. That's yeah, yeah. That was definitely something that Jamie had worked on before I was part of the committee, but he did, they did a great job doing that. And, um, and, it, and managing the trees in a way that we don't have to go ahead and remove them helps us you know, keep this a shaded community without a heat island effect. Um, maintaining these older trees is going to constantly be a, an issue that we have to make sure that as projects go in, um, as people are building sidewalks, that we have appropriate ordinances that take the trees into effect so we're not removing the canopy that's over this town and creating a heat island because um, you know it's a lot easier to take something out than it is to put it back. So. Exactly. One last thing, it would uh, something that I've noticed and I've had several citizens comment about it, and that would be that if we could uh, lend, hopefully get your expertise on how to, and you talk about the canopy, whereas we've got this beautiful canopy of trees, yet when you look at the town square. And then you begin to look at the beautiful mountains in the background. Our trees locally are getting higher and higher. And if there's a way that we could present a program over three to four years with the landowners, get their permission to come in to slowly, you know, thin the tops, the crowns of those in some way yeah. so that you don't lose that over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, I think that's, that's going to be a gradual process as, as far as, just encouraging people not to plant new trees. I mean, the, the trees that are that you're probably referring to are mature, 90-year-old oak trees that are not really growing any faster now than they'll than they'll ever grow. And the pruning would probably um, actually encourage more new growth than it would be to just allow the trees to just continue in their current pattern. I know that in the town square, there's two <coughs> mature. Or they're actually they're moderately mature red oak trees that are gradually growing up, kind of right in front of the police station, and those um, are going to would be difficult trees to manage so that they don't continue to grow up into the view. As well as a lot of the trees that are were planted in the park are going to be fast growing trees that we may want to, over the long term, think about what we want to keep in there and what we want to maybe replace or prune in such a way that it puts it in a different growth pattern. Um, but the height of the trees is something that is better addressed by selecting the right one than trying to prune aggressively or, or mitigate that way. 
Well, good. If y'all just discuss that, I'd yep, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very much. All right, consent agenda. Matt. Yes, sir. You've got um, the adoption of minutes from your agenda workshop and your regular session meetings last month. You've got a uh, budget amendment um, to recognize currently $25,000 for the infrastructure bond for the settings, and that's just to start the process. We, of course, um, have moved the money into an, into um, a, a segregated town account, but this is a budget amendment just to start the process, and so we'd like to do a budget amendment for the $25,000. You have a call for a public hearing for text amendments to the Erosion Prevention and Slope Protection Ordinance, which is our steep slope ordinance. That would be for next month. You have, um, and then finally you have um, a request to award a contract for the Swannanoa River Watershed Restoration Project to Equinox. If you'll recall, that's our, we've uh, we received a grant to um, to perform that study of uh, of the of the Swannanoa River water, watershed and, and and look at some options for uh, for mitigation in this area. And we would like to um, award that contract to the Equinox Company. And that's your items. Any comments on any of these? items on the consent agenda if not do i hear a motion to pass the consent agenda move to approve consent items a and d as presented any more discussion you mean a through d a through d yes okay Sorry. uh any discussion if not all in favor aye uh, opposed all right that's that's passed All right, we're going to be talking next of new business of the Village of Cheshire Master Plan Amendment. And so before that, before we open that up, uh, we would just go ahead and like to see, we've got some citizen comments. If there's anybody who wishes to address that issue, they can come forward now and speak to that. This is on the Village of Cheshire Master Plan Amendment. Come right ahead. This up for the applicant. Is this the correct time to step forward for the applicant? Oh yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna have. Uh, are you Mike? Yes, sir. yes. This is Mike with CDC. And I was gonna have him kind of go through what what the amendments are. Okay. But, okay. but not. But I know you're asking yeah, the public. I'm, I'm have a, if, if anyone have a comment on that. But if they don't, um, then also too, I'm gonna go ahead and say because we're gonna be. Are we gonna be talking about the settings? I think, I think Ron's gonna just give a brief update. Very brief update. Where we are. Yeah, so. this is where we are. Okay. Okay, so since that's on the agenda, the settings uh, bond update, uh, if someone wants to speak to that, they can do so at this time, very, very briefly. I think I've said my piece. Very good. Okay. Michael, you. you want to come forward, please? Good evening, Mayor and uh, Board of Aldermen. My name is Mike Anderson with Civil Design Concepts. We're the engineer of record for the project. I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Jesse Gardner of our office, who's uh, enjoying some vacation time this week. Uh, we are requesting an amendment to the Cheshire Village Master Plan for 2.8 acres of land located between uh, Jane Jacobs and Old Leakey Gap Road. Uh, the amendment proposes a cottage court design modeled after uh, pocket neighborhood design standards. Uh, the plan's been developed by the same uh, design team and uh, civil engineering team since uh, since the beginning of the project. Uh, we're going to continue to follow the character that's been developed in previous phases of Cheshire Village. And the cottage court will follow uh, the setback and design standards uh, included in our application. And if you have any questions for us, I'll be happy to answer those at this time. Not see anything that's Thanks. All right, do we hear a motion? Do I hear a motion to approve the amendment for the Jacobs Cottages to the Village of Cheshire Master Plan? So moved. All right, do we have any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Now, Mr. Sneed will give us an update on the, the Settings bond. Can you? I, I'm sorry. Briefly, I, I, I noticed in here. Can we do a? Can we make a motion to approve the statement of consistency for the that we kind of do when we when, when we have 
public hearing. We have a we have that again in our in our. I need a motion paperwork. for the statement of consistency. So moved. On favor. Uh, opposed. All right. That's unanimous. Now for the settings bond update. Okay. This will be the two minute version, as all of you obviously know by now, after a year and a half, almost two years of lawsuit, we've got the bond money, it's in a bank account. We're going to initiate this process, and it isn't all mapped out yet, but since the town has the money, we're taking the initial steps of, of getting engineering estimates and plans and, and bidding the project out uh, as any city must. We have some other things, some hurdles to look at down the road. You heard a lot tonight about issues that may be in-house issues amongst the homeowners association. But we haven't, the town hasn't worked its way to that point. We have the money. We're looking at uh, getting the, at least the cost estimates up. We're actually working off the original plans for the development to see if that can be completed as planned. And those will be bid out in the normal fashion for town. Lowest responsible bidder will get the job to complete the project as far as the money goes. Uh, there, after that point, there are some, a variety of ways that the town and the association work on it. Those are not ironed out yet. But we are taking the initial steps. Uh, there, there is hope that the project can be at least substantially done by the time cold weather sets in next winter, and we have to stop work. So they're going at it as fast as they can to get the bidding done. Anybody on the board wants to say anything? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sneed. No unfinished business. Uh, public hearing. Uh, public hearing on tax amendments to the minimum housing code of the land use code. Uh, Josh, if you'd come up. Josh, here. Yeah. You'd come up and brief the board and the audience on what they're about to vote on, and then we'll open up the uh, public hearing. Sure. So this is probably going around longer than I've been employed here, but. I think about two years the Housing Commission worked on the updating the minimum housing code. Some state statutes changed, so there needed to be some updates performed to the code. Um, also in our uh, comprehensive plan update, there was a high priority of looking at our minimum housing code, making sure we're enforcing it, and to enhance the minimum housing code. So what you have before you has been before the planning board. They have recommended approval unanimously, and I can just I'll just go through it, if, if, if that's okay. <coughs> so really in the first section, not a whole lot of changes here. Anything in red, the strike throughs of course is being omitted and anything bold and underlined is being added as something new. Um, I don't know that that's worth even mentioning. 2.2.3, minimum documentation for dwellings and dwelling units. Uh, basically the statutes provide that this is a voluntary process. We're not mandating this. So they are, this is a voluntary process to um, to provide the documentation. We cannot require that by law. Section C of that is just giving myself, the planning director, the ability to waive some fees to encourage completion of a safety checklist. If, the, if they so chose to provide a safety checklist, they would not have to do that. And section 2.2.4 probably is the biggest, or let's say the largest addition to this code. And I'll be glad to read this line for line, but it may take a while. Um, really what this is, this came directly out of the Buncombe County Rental Housing Ordinance that was passed in 1998. It's pretty much verbatim what that ordinance says in this section, which is minimum standards of fitness for dwellings and dwelling units. So this section really is is being proposed to be required now really to provide some protection for the tenant of the property. Currently in our ordinance we do have a section that is labeled the same but it does not go into near as much detail as this proposal does. But things such as street address being supplied on the dwelling unit, uh, light and ventilation requirements, electrical systems, exterior and interior requirements, roofs, stairs and porches, space requirements, uh, heating systems, chimneys, 
all those would be would now be proposed to be looked at a little closer than they are today. 2.2.5 is unsafe conditions which we currently have in our code and you can see in this section there's not a whole lot of changes. We have added a couple of things, lack of properly function, functioning sanitary facilities is something new. Pretty much this section is just really going to look at whether or not the building or the structure is safe for someone to live in. A lot of this stuff in this section is kind of it's standard stuff that you see in a lot of places. We did add a section about chimneys and heating systems. The enforcement part also was something that was changed by uh, state statute, so now it's a little, it's been changed a little. Um, we've got in here anything that's, like I said, underlined in bold, talks about the landlord or agent. Um, you're given, if there's a, a complaint in the town, would give the landlord or the agent 30 days to repair the unsafe conditions before, before we would do any type of enforcement procedures. Section B talks about inspections allowed. Once we receive a complaint, then you would have, the landlord would have the 30 days to provide the necessary corrections. Then the building inspector would be able to do the inspections. Um, talks about a complaint in there. If there's vis visible violations of this ordinance that, that's notice noticeable from outside of the property. Um, if there's a history of more than two verified violations within a 12 month period. Section C, we've omitted the previous section C and added a new section uh, which talks about if it appears the building inspector of the dwelling or dwelling unit does not meet minimum standards contained in the ordinance, of course the building inspector issues a notice of violation. Owner is given 30 calendar days to correct the violations. This would be after the 30 days that they had previously if they were notified by the tenant. We do provide some waivers in here. If the structure was originally built to a specific code, then it would, wouldn't have to meet this current code. Section E talks specifically about appeals. So if the, the, the landlord is, does not agree with the building inspector's decision, he can always appeal to the Board of Adjustment, just like they do today, with any type of zoning decision. And that is the majority of it. Okay. So you've heard now, and now listen, you need to get a motion to open the public hearing on the minimum housing cottage. So moved. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that's unanimous. So anyone from the audience that wishes to speak? To the minimum housing code, you may come forward down. Talk to us. Not seeing anyone making a mad dash. Do I hear a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. All right. We need uh, we need a motion to adopt the ordinance. Can we ask some questions first, Mayor? Uh, Time to do that. that? Usually we do it after we make a motion, but I mean, if you want to do it before. That's... Are you saying a motion to move to approve? Yeah. Or do you want to have it before? I'd like to have it before. Clar okay. Clarify some things. Okay. How do we do it? I think, that, I think that's fine. We, you know, if you're asking for information still, I think you can do it before you call a motion. Okay. Okay. Don. All right. Go ahead. Josh Chimneys. Correct. It says it has to be done by a certified chimney, chimney sweep. Okay. Uh, I've had my own brushes for years, bought the whole extensions, the, you know, the whole nine yards that I use on my house and the, the two rental houses. What is, is this requiring someone to, to get a certified chimney sweep or can a homeowner continue cleaning it himself. I mean, these this, are all, this applies only to rent, rental units. Okay. Well, I, I, I mentioned two rental, rental houses second, too. It comes to the second half of your question. Yeah. So, the rental houses, 
I have to stop doing that? The way I would interpret this, Alderman Collins, would be, if you're still doing it, I don't know that there would be an issue with you still doing it. If there ends up being complaints or inspections that need to be done, then I think that would be the time when we would need to make sure that a chimney sweep was performing that service. All right. Section C, it says 90 calendar days if the building is unoccupied, the owner uh, ha has to uh, make changes, repairs, perform such work as necessary. Why would that be necessary if it's unoccupied? I think that's getting it if there's been a violation on the property. So we, we would want to assure that if there's a violation on the property that it's corrected before it's ever rented out again. I can understand that, but should it not say something similar to that? You know, you're, you're, you're forcing somebody to fix something and they may not have any intentions on renting it again. want to see something in there we'd be glad to It'd be completely up to you if you want to add something uh, the penalties what are the penalties what section is that? Uh, section F I don't know the exact dollar figure for the penalties under 160A 175 Fifty dollars a day comes to mind. I'm not sure if that's correct, but that I know that's that's what we do for for other violations. But I can't honestly tell you exactly what that penalty is under 160A175. So that takes me then back to what we were talking about. If the building is unoccupied and it, let's say it's going to take longer than 90 days, is the town going to be able to come back and, and start charging somebody fifty dollars a day because he's he's waiting on? I'm fairly certain there's a section here where we, we can provide some extensions um, under circumstances. And that, that under C, where you're, where you're reading about the 90 days to make uh -huh. the completion, of the last sentence is the building inspector may grant extensions of time for completion of the required measures. I think that's where, okay. that's where that would come into effect. So that, you know, that probably there could be a circumstance in there where, where the building inspector would say, sure, we'll give you another 60 days or, or whatever it might take. I've Josh, got a couple questions. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mayor. Josh, can you can you summarize for me if I'm if I'm um, uh, a citizen who comes in and they they're thinking about purchasing a piece of rental property? Um, so, it, are they just summarize for me what you what we would need to tell um, um, a potential investor um, uh, as to how the town is going to uh, how this ordinance impacts the investor are we making it more difficult and, and you can you speak in general terms it's fine you don't need to really go are we making it more difficult um, and costly for an investor to have a rental house I think the, the answer to, the, to those both could be yes or right, is it and is it by a significant margin and, and Matt, Matt Ron, you know, you structure. guys could chime in as well. But you know, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the, um, the, the general comfort feel you'd want to get. Obviously, we don't want anyone to be, uh, you know, uh, abused by um, uh, un unsafe and unfair and and uh, you know, just simply, you know, unreasonable living conditions as a tenant. But at the same time, we want to. You know, we want to have a balance as to what we're demanding of people who are investing in rental properties. I don't think there's any way we can that, that as a, as staff we could say that some that, that we're going to impact um, rental fees by by significant margin or any margin. I don't think uh, the goal here is is I think as you said is to is to create a a, a safe environment for for renters. 
is there an impact? I don't think there's any question there's an impact on that. And, that, and, and, those, and, and, and owners of property will have to make a decision on how they pass costs along or, or um, how they address the issues at hand. I, I don't know that uh, I don't know that ask I don't know that you can I don't know that we can can uh, speculate though on what what the impact is and so so as as this came through the process from the housing commission to the planning board to here I, 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 I think it's fair to say that that was probably the, the that was not the uh, um, emphasis that they were looking at and so they were looking at it from the other side and the renter side and we don't know the impact on that and and then you all will consider what the impact might be. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put that no, on you unless you no, think there's more to no, it. No, the board has to remember that, that the legislature has put certain standards on the landlord anyway, the Residential Rental Agreement Act. And it's a little broader in definition, but it's, but in this, your minimum housing code sort of fleshes out that same law. It tells the landlord what he's got to do. You can look at your minimum housing code and know what it is. If I do these things, then... I'm in compliance with the Residential Rental Agreement Act because they specify what's safe. The flip side of that is if I'm a landlord and I've got a piece of property and I want to rent it and I do half a decent job of taking care of my tenants, now occasionally you'll get the crazy tenant who's going to come and make a complaint because the flowers are the wrong color. But the minimum housing code doesn't kick in if I'm a landlord and I've got a rental property and my tenant isn't showing up isn't giving me 30 days notice to come and fix something, and I don't. If I fix it in 30 days, he's not going to be to you. I think that's in the minimum housing code. Mm -hmm. The landlord's got to have a 30-day chance to fix that. 31st day, and I haven't fixed it, then he comes to the town, and then you got the minimum housing code. We can't force inspections. We can't force registration. We're not attempting to. But I think it gets the repeat offender, I guess. You're... You can't come and inspect and, and do anything that the town can't unless I've got a history of violations with the town that haven't been remedied. So it, it sounds rather harsh, but it's a long ways before it gets to the town to enforce anything. Uh, the landlord can literally ignore a lot of these as long as he's keeping his tenant happy because it's not going to come to the town to find out there's a handful of violations until the tenant complains. We don't get to go and inspect unless we're called in. We don't get called in until landlords had 30 days to remedy whatever the problem is. And just to clarify, if we if if it's, if you did have a situation where we were required to go in and inspect, is there a fee to the uh, a fee involved with that? I don't I don't know, Larry. If there's a fee, I can't. Um, um, I, so the, I can well, I can waive inspection fees okay. to encourage push them a safety checklist. So, the, so there is an inspection the fee, but you have the you have the authority to waive them. Now the landlord has the option of coming to Josh first and say, "Let's just head this off. I'm going to rent this house. Come and inspect it." And I think that's where he, we used to talk about an inspection fee. But in the interest of safety, the Josh's department said we'd waive those fees just so that we get we get the jump on it, the landlord doesn't have a problem, the tenant's safe, and everybody's happy. But that's entirely voluntary. Yeah, and that goes back to the, that goes back to the beginning to the minimum documentation for, for safety standards. That yes, that, that but that's voluntary. We, voluntary. We don't we don't uh, require that. In section two point two six enforcement, um, I've noticed there the language has changed. You're saying that that was changed by the state, that the any, state any, legislator changed that. Any, any specific um, Yes, subsection? the third line, the building inspector shall inspect the property. And now it comes in, the building inspector may inspect the property under one of the All conditions. mandatory inspections yeah. were pretty well done in mm -hmm. the legislature right. over the last few years. And that's what we struck out to and change that. They, so they, they're the ones that did away with that. That's yeah. not. And they're doing it again this year. If the legislature stays with it, we will have no building. According to Dan, we'll have no building inspections in 2018. Yeah. yeah. The only comment I've got about it is on the heating systems about that you would have to have every room, habitable room, to be 68 degrees. 
That's a standard set in the legislature, not with the town. That that was set by the legislature. Yes, that's that's state that's statutory means of determining whether or not you've got adequate heat. It's not our doing. Any other questions? Josh, how do citizens or people who rent, how are they made aware of this code? We, when we definitely don't broadcast it, at least I don't broadcast it to folks. Um, people in my office, Dan or Jennifer, you know, if they get, if they get, com someone's got an issue, typically they would call them and file a complaint. Um, at that point, of course, we'd make them aware of the code. Then they would be sitting, then they'd be sitting back to, because the code <coughs> requires them to Make, give notification to the landlord. We would we would advise them then on, on the process. They, I think Josh is right. They generally come to us, or would come to us with a complaint. And they would be they would be told of the of the procedure they had to follow, which would take them a couple steps back before we were involved. Because I've had some people who come to me and ask me about things like this, and I've always referred them back to the town. Mm -hmm. But I was just kind of sitting here thinking when people initially seek to rent something in town. Is there not a way of having something printed out like this to give them? Or do landlords give them at the time that they're signing their lease? We, we, we could. They, wouldn't be we, 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 they wouldn't be required to give something like this to them. I mean, just as an information tool for the, the people who are renting the property. I, I mean, I think, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I think that most of, um, and I, I can't speak for obviously all landlords in town, but most of the property management companies. Um, have been involved in the process. I think this is fair to say. Have been involved in the process along the way and are aware of uh, of of the changes and had a lot of input into the changes. So now, I, now that doesn't mean that I know what they're going to give right. to uh, to their renters. But I think I think that the property management companies are are aware and and uh, and and a, and a variety of informed landlords around town are aware. But I don't know the answer to that exactly. Josh. What would be a figure that has that would come to mind for either people coming to you to Dan for complaints? Since I've been here, one. So I, I have dealt with one in a year. I don't know that Dan's dealt with many more than that since I've been here. Okay. I would, you know, two or three a year maybe would probably be about standard. All right. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Yeah. We'll make them, let's go ahead. This is something jumped out to me when I was reading this on 2.23C. I think there's a word thrown in there that it made no sense to me when I read it. I mean, the, I, or maybe I'm just not reading it correctly. The last sentence of 2.23C. Missing shell, there's a missing an S. Oh, it's Hall, and I thought, yeah, what, is, what is that? Okay, okay, I got you. Makes sense now. <laughs> All right, uh, do I hear a motion to adopt this? I have one more question. Wait, this, go ahead. Uh, Mike, for Ron. Ron, could you again just explain, you know, the, the, the statutory rights that, that tenants have and and maybe just you know, just what we're adding when we add to the you know with this you're, minimum you're housing adding, code. You're probably doing nothing but adding detail and procedure to the Residential Rental Agreement Act, which mandates and there's a, a, a sort of a short list of things that must be up to a certain standard in the Residential Rental Agreement Act. Uh, the minimum housing code sort of fleshes that out. Probably a little bit more guidance for a landlord. The landlord will take the residential rental agreement act and says, okay, I know I've got to provide a safe structure, mm -hmm. and I know I've got to make sure these four things are okay, but it, it's very general. And, and this probably, if I were a landlord, I'd find this helpful. Now I know what the specifics are. But to not adopt the minimum housing code doesn't mean that I get to go back to renting shacks because right. I've got to provide potable water, heating, uh, Good doors, good windows, plumbing, electricity, all of those things. Uh, those, those are spelled out. I think this just gives a little bit more detail to what is good and what is not when the push comes to shove. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, do I hear a motion? So moved to adopt it. Okay. Any more discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. We need to adopt a statement of consistency. Do I have a motion? So moved. 
All right, all in favor? Aye. Opposed, that's unanimous also. Okay, thanks. Now we've got a public hearing on the text amendment to one-way road width and subdivisions to the land use code. If you wouldn't mind, actually, I would I would call on uh, Spencer Elliott to uh, to kind of give you an update there if that's if that's appropriate. Good evening. Uh, this request came from us at the fire department uh, to the planning department for this text amendment. Uh, first of all, the North Carolina Fire Code actually stipulates that all buildings within the jurisdiction of the town should have roads 20 feet wide for the purpose of fire apparatus access. Now, what we've run into as we've gone through some subdivision is they want to do one-way streets to less than that 20 feet. The code basically doesn't give you any option for that. It's 20 feet. Um, so we've came back with, with something that's common sense that'll work in a safe manner. Uh, the two extra feet we're asking for basically does not have to be a paved surface, but a flat surface that can be driven on. So a 12 foot wide paved surface with an extra foot of shoulder on each side, gravel or concrete guttering, whatever they want to do, as long as it's drivable by the fire apparatus access, gives us the extra space we need. The thing is the side of a fire truck is actually a workspace once we park the truck and go to work on a fire. We have an engineer there. He's monitoring pump pressures as well as the fire scene. Hoses are going through this area and it becomes a workspace for our employees. Um, this is basically a safety thing for us. Uh, you start putting the ledge gutters, curbing, uh, you're making a trip hazard where we're going to be working around all this stuff too. It's an already a pretty dangerous job and we're just trying to reduce a couple of risks with an extra foot of drivable surface. Uh, and again, let me clar clarify, we're not asking for another two feet of pavement. We're, we're asking for a foot on each side that's drivable. It can be gravel, it can be, a lot of times they want to do this flat guttering. I think the settings has pretty flat guttering in there and two or three others that works. You got Good. Good. Thank you. Because I, I was asking that question at the, at the, at the agenda meeting, so I'm glad you clarified that. Y'all have any more questions? No. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion? Open up the public hearing. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, unanimous. So the public hearing is now open to discuss this issue. And again, the issue is not adding pavement, but just adding a substrate so that there would be a total width of 14 feet. Not seeing anybody here. Motion to close the public hearing. So moved. On favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous also. Now I need a motion to adopt ordinance 015-09. So moved. All right. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous also. And then to adopt a statement of consistency. Motion? So moved. All right. In favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous again. Communication from staff. Ron, you got anything? I'm used up. <laughs> <laughs> then I would, add, I, I, would, I would remind you of two things that we do have. Uh, um, vacancies for boards and commissions. I would uh, remind the, the public and, the, and of course the board that to, uh, we'll, we'll advertise that in the paper. I think the next three weeks with a deadline for that is May 29th. We'll do, uh, those, are, those vacancies will, will um, be appointed in July of next year. If people are interested, we'd like to, to uh, people to uh, turn an application to the town clerk's office and I would encourage everybody that is interested to, uh, to participate. They will, there'll be a list in the paper tomorrow of the, of the different vacancies. Um, but but we do have a variety of boards and commissions and vacancies in all of those. And just would, a second uh, then on that. Now will that be in the in the little block that we normally, or is this going to be a separate article? It's a separate article. It was last the, week. In the it's paper. already run once. Okay. It'll run two more times. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, and then I would remind you too that you have a um, uh, your second budget workshop next week. Is it next week? No, two weeks. May May twentieth. At the 20th at 8:30 in the morning, and um, so if you have any 
any uh, suggestions or questions or, or need more information, we will uh, we'll continue with that process on May the 20th. And that's all that I have. All right. Uh, any comments from the board members? If not, call the meeting adjourned.